All right, let's get into chapter 14. This is over personality. So to preface this chapter, um, we're going to go over several different perspectives of the psychology of personality. So there are several different perspectives on determining from where personality comes and many ideas within these perspectives. We'll go through four different perspectives of personality and also underneath that, the psychologists, individual psychologists understanding of personality. So first, the, the first perspective we're gonna go through is a psychodynamic perspective. And one of the main or, or most popular, most out there psychologists on this perspective of personality is Sigmund Freud, which I'm sure most of you guys have heard of him. And he coined the term psychic determinism. This is the belief that unconscious processes underlie all conscious thoughts and actions. So that means everything you say and do has a larger unconscious reasoning underneath. Okay. So for the id, he has, he, he breaks the personal personality down into three types, three stages, I guess, the id, the ego, and the superego. So the id is a component of personality that is present at birth and tries to satisfy basic drives and survival instincts. So um, this is what occurs when, you know, from baby to like, to, you know, the first few years of life, when you haven't really developed any morality, any societal cues, anything like that, you're just kind of living. So um, this is why impulse control lacks so much is because you are trying to satisfy your basic needs um, and you're just going off of your survival instincts. Um, and underneath the id is the pleasure principle. This is the process by which the id seeks immediate gratification and pays no attention to societal expectations or constraints. Okay, then the next phase is, or stage, whatever, is the ego. This is the component of personality that represents the rational part of the mind. So you're a little bit older. You you may lie to get out of a punishment. Um, according to the reality principle, the ego attempts to achieve the id's goals. So you're you're trying to satisfy your basic drives and survival instincts, but you're trying to do it through actions that will be pleasurable rather than painful. So... Um, you may lie to get what you want because you're trying to satisfy a basic drive or, or survival instinct, but you don't want to go about it a certain way. So you're going to lie about it to get what you want. Um, so that's why, you know, I, some, you know, younger kids, they might start to lie to get out of trouble when they did what they wanted to do rather than what they're supposed to do. Um, so that is the ego. And then the super ego comes later in life. Um, this is a component of personality that considers societal constraints and acceptable forms of behavior. So this is when your morals and societal co code have been established. And so you know more of what's right or what's wrong. And those kind of determine um, your decisions and your behaviors. And, and I, wanna, I want to remind you that all of these are just kind of theories. These are not concrete. These are just ideas of where personality come from. Okay, next is Jung. He's the next psychologist through the psychodynamic perspective of personality. He had the idea that we all kind of um, work off of a collective unconscious. This is a shared pool of memories and images common to all humans. And then um, through that, there are archetypes. These are prototypical images from the collective unconscious that can be seen repeatedly in various forms of art, literature, dreams, and religions. So what this is saying is there are universal themes and concepts in life, and archetypes allow us to respond to the environment in predictable ways. Okay, now Alder. Um, he coined individual psychology. Um, there's a universal motivation to achieve superiority while emphasizing that each person's unique struggle with feelings of inferiority is the key to understanding their personality. Um, he also talked about how birth order, if you've ever um, heard of birth order psychology, where 
you know, if you are an only child, if you're the oldest child, if you're the middle child, if you're the youngest child, what that does to you in, um, it's, it, it brings a unique struggle to, um, how you feel inferior in, in different cases. And that shapes your personality. Um, maybe the oldest child has the most pressure on them because, you know, the, the parents had the most, um, individual time with them. So they have the most pressure to succeed Then maybe the youngest child, um, you know, has, has the pressure from all their siblings they see who came before them, or they have the least amount of pressure because their parents were, were tired or, you know, more relaxed by the time they were growing up. Um, so it just depends on each person and the unique struggles with pretty much trying to prove themselves. And that shapes personality according to Alder. And then Horny, um, she wanted a, re she wanted to reject Sigmund Freud's idea of penis envy, which is basically saying that all females are jealous of men, that they don't have penises. I don't know. It's weird. Um, but she she came up with kind of the counter of that, which is womb envy. And this is where men experience jealousy due to a woman's role in nurturing and sustaining life. And they're kind of uh, not just physically, but also the societal norm of getting to be nurturing while it's not as societally normal um, for men to be nurturing. And she dictates that society deems what is acceptable for normal male and female behavior. So there can be kind of resentment on both sides. Um, maybe some women want to do things that are deemed socially acceptable for, for men and vice versa. And so there can be some resentment there of, well, I want to do that, but I also don't want to be jeered at or looked at differently for doing what I think is best for me. Okay, the next perspective is a humanist, humanistic perspective. Maslow, um, okay, so first the, the humanistic perspective overall, if you kind of put it all together, all of the psychologists' views, um, one big theme in the humanistic perspective is the inherent value of every person. Every person has value, no matter who they are, what they've done, what stage of life they're in. Every person has value. Okay, so Maslow, he is a big name under the humanistic perspective, and he coined the term self-actualization. This is an, an individual's experience of becoming their real self and realizing their fullest potential as a human being. So becoming you become your real self, um, not what others want you to be, you know, your ideal or ought self, which we talked about in previous chapters. Um, and then you realize your fullest potential. You should strive for this. And this is how you contribute most to the world. So you should strive to be exactly the best version of who you can be, not who you think you should be or who other people think you should be, but just the best version of who you are. And you can reach your fullest potential and contribute the most to the world in that way, because uh, you're the only person who is you and the only person with your exact skill set. So if you become the best version of who you are, then you can contribute to the world in the, in the way that only you know how. Okay, next is Rogers. Uh, he thought of self-concepts. This is a person's understanding of who they are, who he or she is. Um, so really you're asking the question, who am I? Am I a brother? Am I a sister? Am I a mom? Am I a dad? Am I, you know, whatever my occupation is? Am I funny? Am I lovable? Am I kind? Am I not, you know, all, am I attractive? You know, all these things. So it's the understanding of who you are. Um, so other people can help us become our actual selves by accepting us, acting genuinely and showing us empathy. And that is unconditional positive regard, the ability to accept and value another person despite their problems and weaknesses. So you're not unconditionally loving or unconditionally holding the, the wrong things people do in regard. You're not saying, I, I, I have an unconditional love for you. And I have unconditional love for the bad things you do. No, it's saying no matter what you do, although I don't agree with what you do or 
it's kind of you think of you know what a parent you think of a friend you think of yes you did something stupid and i'm disappointed in you but that does not take away from how much i love you so that's unconditional positive regard and people need that in their lives especially growing up you need to know that you have people that will love you regardless so if people don't receive that then they have what's called conditions of worth which is i'm only good if i do this that you are not accepted and valued as a person you are accepted and valued based off of the things you do not because like i said the humanistic perspective is you're you have inherent value which is you know basically built in value simply because you are a person you are a person so you have value and so what the conditions of worth is saying you're not you're not a value because you're human you're a value because of the things you do and that is really hard um especially growing up but throughout life if you feel like the only worth you have is because of the things you do not because of who you are so it's very important for everyone to have people in their lives that that give them unconditional positive regard and that they don't live off of conditions of worth Next is the social cognitive perspective. And first off, I want to talk about something that Rotter found to be very important. The first is you are the company you keep. You, you become a reflection of your environment. Uh, you are the company you keep. You become like the five people you spend the most time with or the, you know, the people you spend the most time with. That's who you start to reflect. And that definitely shapes your personalities at different points in time, because, you know, the people, probably the people you spend the most time with in first grade are not the same people you spend the most time with in high school are not the same people you spend the most time with at 30 years old and so on and so forth. I mean, there might be some overlap there if it's family or, you know, a very close friend that you have for life. Um, but you are the company you keep. You become like the people you spend the most time with. Okay. He also talks about uh, how much control oh, you feel you have over your life shapes your personality. So a personal control is the sense of having control over one's environment. So this is determined based off of your locus of control, which is kind of like your center of control. Where does this control come from? So your locus of control is your perception or belief about the amount of control you have over your situations. So if you have an internal locus of control, you feel like, you are the one in control. If you have an external locus of control, you feel like you are susceptible to whatever forces are going on around you, that you are susceptible to your surroundings, your situation, your environment, and you do not have control over it. So what is the difference between having an internal locus of control and an external locus of control? Well, it totally shifts how you perceive the world, how you perceive yourself, and how you perceive your abilities. If you feel like you have control over your environment, then you have control over your actions, your beliefs, and your ability to do things, your, your, your competence to get things done, your ability to change your situation, your ability to make your situation better if you want it to be your ability to change your future. But if you have an external locus of control, then you feel like you don't have any power to enact change. So why are you even going to bother? You'll have more motivation to do things, to change things. If you have an internal locus of control versus if it's all out of your control, why will you even try to change anything? So external locus of control, you're completely susceptible to your surroundings and therefore that's going to change your personality you're going to have more external excuses rather than saying for internal if you mess up that's my fault um i take responsibility if you have an external locus of, of control you're going to say well something else something else outside of myself is what made this happen and i have no control over this so i'm just kind of a product of my environment of my environment Okay, Bandura um, 
he came up with reciprocal determinism. This is a social cognitive concept that highlights the bi-directional relationship between the environment, behavior, and personality. So I don't know if you remember us talking about the fundamental attribution error back a few chapters. Um, this is saying we must know that the environment slash situation plays just as much, if not more of a role in behavior. And this is saying that um, Bandura is saying something kind of along the same. So if you keep the fundamental attribution error um, in mind, saying that we tend to overemphasize someone's personality for causing something to happen and we underemphasize their environment or the situation, then we're not seeing the whole picture clearly. But this is saying that there is a relationship each way um, that all three affect each other, that the environment affects behavior, environment affects personality, behavior affects environment, personality affects environment, and behavior uh, affects personality and personality affects behavior. It's like a, an ongoing triangle that can flow in any direction that they can all affect one another. So it's important to keep that in mind that it's not all just based off of the environment. It's not just all based off of someone's behavior. It's not just all based off of someone's personality, that they all affect one another. And it's, it's important to keep that in mind. So your self-efficacy can, um, can stem from that, but also um, if, we, if we think a little bit back, you know, this has a little bit of broader influence on it, self-efficacy and individual's expectations and beliefs about their own abilities to perform certain tasks. Um, so if we have this expectancy to be competent in something, we are going to feel more capable to, to do anything. We are going to feel better about ourselves. We're going to have a better view of our self-efficacy. But if we, we if we have a low efficacy expectancy, that's kind of hard to say, efficacy expectancy, then we're not going to feel that we are very competent. And a few chapters ago, we talked about, you know, kind of a full rounded person and, and, and feeling confident in yourself Part of that comes with feeling competent about yourself, that, that people want autonomy, they want to be able to make their own decisions, and they want to feel competence um, in order to feel good about themselves. Because if you feel incompetent, if you feel like you can't do it, then you're going to feel kind of low about yourself. You're not going to feel very self-efficient. Okay, next is the trait perspective in the biology of personality. So a trait is a relatively stable disposition to behave in a particular way. This is um, like, we'll, we'll get into it in, a, in another slide, but these are kind of your core personality traits, okay? These are the things that are at your core. No matter who you're with, it's not going to change. There are some things that change depending on who you're with, but these are things that are core to who you are. So could tell, uh, deemed that surface traits, which are personality traits that are easily visible to others and originate from source traits, that these are things that can change. And um, depending on who kind of you're with. So these are personality traits that are easily visible and originate from source traits. But then source traits are the underlying factor or origin of surface traits. These stem from, um, so surface traits stem from core personality traits and then source traits are your core personality traits. These are um, things that we'll talk about right here. So McCray and Costa came up with the five factor model. This is a trait theory of personality suggesting five underlying factors or traits of personality. These are kind of the five core personality traits that a person can have and it kind of shapes their personality according to McCray and Costa and kind of according to Cattell. So um, some of you guys may have, may have heard of the ocean test or the big five, as they call it. Um, and I, I encourage you guys to go online and see if you can find a free version of the, the big five or the five factor model test. So this will determine based off of how you answer questions, uh, where you lie on the ocean. So O stands for your openness to experience. How open-minded are you? How open are you to new things? Next is conscientiousness. How much do you think, like, 
how much do you think through processes and how much do you think of yourself and others when making decisions? Okay, how, how much do you think through things? Uh, e is extroversion. That is how high of a social tolerance do you have? Um, are you someone that, that craves social interaction often um, or are you someone that doesn't? Next is agreeableness. This is how well you get along with all sorts of people. Okay. Are you easily, do you kind of go with the flow in terms of, you know, I can be friends with anyone or are you a little bit more highly opinionated and more picky? And then lastly is neuroticism, which is also known as emotional stability. So are you high in extroversion and low in openness to experience? Are you, are you low in neuroticism and high in agreeableness? Um, are you high in all of these things? Are you low in all these things? Um, so I, I encourage you guys to, to take this test and, and see kind of what you think, if you think it's accurate based off of the idea you have of yourself. Okay. This is um, the last two slides over. This is kind of more into the bio biological perspective of personality. So we have two systems within our nervous system, brain system, um, that determine our behavior. So we have the behavioral activation system and the behavioral inhibition system. So the behavioral activation system is this brain system that activates approach to behavior and response to anticipation of a reward. So it's like, okay, well, if I do this, then something good is going to come out of this. But the behavioral inhibition system, um, which should say BIS, not BAS, because that's BAS, um, BIS is the brain system that inhibits approach behavior in response to the anticipation of a punishment. Well, if I do this, then I'm going to get in trouble. Or if I do this, someone's feelings are going to get hurt. Or if I do this, someone's going to get mad at me. If I do this, I'm going to get fired, whatever it is. So is there a brain systems telling us that if we do something, um, will something good will happen? Or if we do something, something bad will happen and it prevents or promotes a behavior. And then um, I want to touch on a field of science um, that that we're tr that is is still trying to figure out kind of the origins of personality, and that's personality neuroscience. This is the field of personality development that utilizes brain imaging techniques to examine the brain structure and function and how they relate to personality. That's something that's really hard to do because we can only, we, we've only learned so much about the brain and how it functions. And so um, with all the imaging that we have available to us, um, researchers are trying to figure out, you know, what are the areas of the brain related to personality? How is this where personality stems from? You know, what, what is it? Where does personality come from? And then lastly, we know that some personality comes from our genetics. They come, it's, it's, it's heritable. It's so heritability is the percentage of phenotype, which is observable traits that is associated with the variation in genotype. So, which are our genetics. So we know that to some extent, personality is heritable. It's in our genes that we get it from our parents and, and our parents' parents and our parents' parents' parents. Um, but we also know that personality, so we know that personality has a genetic component, but that's not the full picture, okay? We know multiple genes are only part of the explanation. We know that, you know, it might be, I think I read that about 40% of our personality comes from our genetics, okay? So we don't have some say, but we, in, in, in our personalities, but we have more say than we think we do. Um, also, a shared environment is less important than once thought. Like um, siblings being raised in the same home. You see siblings, you know, they, they, they're grown in a shared environment. But I know I'm one of seven kids and we have vastly different personalities. That's, that's only part of it. So we have our genes, or we have our genetics, we have our shared environment. And then we also know that behavioral genetic research should focus less on genes and more on unique environments. So these individual, while you may have grown up in a shared environment, you still had individual unique experiences. So 
that is, so we have three main things that make up our personality. We have our genetic component, we have our shared environments, and we have our unique environments that shape up our personalities. All right, that is the end of chapter 14.